Big new fun idea today. So to get there as we so often do, we need to take a step back. Let's rewind a little bit. We are in this big topic, which we started at the end of last year. And of course the topic is called integration. Now, integration is a really big deal in mathematics. It does so many things. It's as big as algebra in some ways, in terms of like, how many parts of mathematics relate to algebra? Answer, how many parts of math don't relate to algebra? It touches everything. Integration is much the same. But we met it first in the context of this question, right? We, re we realized that areas could be solved, particular kinds of areas could be solved through integration, right? So we would say, that the area bounded between a particular curve and, for example, the x-axis, we would write it in a particular way. Do you remember how we would write it? What would I, um, what would I put on this integral sign? I would put some boundaries, some limits, right? So I might say, let's start here, and then let's go to there. And then after the integral sign, after the limits, I would put two objects. What two objects would I put? <laughs> I would put the integrand, whatever it happens to be. So for example, let's just say it's y, okay? And then I would put the the dx or the dy, whatever it happened to be, which tells me what, which direction am I looking in? What, what kind of integration am I doing here? Now, I want you to remember what these three things are. One, two, three, because they are all crucial to understanding what we're about to do next. The integral sign, sorry, the, the integral sign <laughs> means, like it's a stretched out, Will, do you mind getting that window for me? It's a stretched out letter S because what? It's a sum. Now, what is it a sum of? And the answer is these two things multiplied together. What, what do these represent? Draw a picture. Say you've got a function like this. Say y equals x squared. Okay. If I were to take the area from, I don't know, sum a to sum b, then the thing I, or the things rather, that I'm adding up are these tiny infinitesimally thin rectangles, right? So you can like sort of draw them in. Here they are. When they're so thin, they look like straight lines, but they do have an infinitesimal width, right? So now you tell me, again, what are these two objects that we're adding up? They are the, the height multiplied by the width of the rectangle. Does that make sense? Okay, so remember this. We are summing, and what we are summing, what we are adding up, is these rectangles. Each part of the rectangle is important. There's the height, there's the width. Okay, so this is what integration does, this is what it performs, and we learned that amazingly, uh, we can use the primitive function, the, the reverse of the derivative function, we can use the primitive function to, to work out what happens next. Okay. Now here's my point. Why, why is it that integration is so amazingly flexible and can do so many things? Well, it turns out that often what we want to do is add up a whole bunch of infinitesimally thin things. And that skill, that ability, is useful in a wide variety of contexts. Like, say, for example, this one. So I want you to redraw this same curve. There you go. Just as an example, I could have done any. Okay. Then I want you to take that same interval, A to B, like that. Now, if I were interested in this area, I know how to do that. I know how to do that. I'm just going to color this in in a slightly different color. I would go and do all these infinitesimally thin rectangles. No big deal. But what I'm going to suggest is something different, because we know how to do this already. I want to imagine taking this area and rotating it around an axis. Let me say that again. I want to picture taking this area and rotating it around an axis. So it's sort of going to come out of the board. If I were to try and represent it, it would look something like this. Now, this is hard to picture, which is why I thought I would give you an illustration of it. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm no potter. Um, I tried doing pottery actually when I was like in year seven or something like that. And that's how I know this is way harder than it looks. It usually just becomes this mess of like goop in your hands. Okay? But what is this guy doing? 
What he's got down here, what is this thing doing? It's spinning, spinning real fast, okay? And you can see his hands barely move. His hands barely move. But because the disc is spinning, he creates this round shape, right? He just holds it in place and it molds the clay. Does that make sense? And you can see as he progresses, so long as he doesn't move too fast or lose control, he creates this symmetrical object, but it's not like reflectional symmetry, it's, what kind of symmetry is this? It's rotational symmetry because the, the object is made by rotation, okay? So you can see he's created this solid, and the solid of course has a volume, it's, it's got some substance to it, okay? But the way he's made the solid is by revolution, by spinning, by rotation, okay? So we call this object, he's almost finished with it, so I'm about to, I'm just trying to stall for him to actually finish his bowl. Um, we call this object, because it's a solid, and it's been formed by revolution, very originally, there we go. Uh, oh, I missed the frame. Let's go back. That'll do. We call this object a solid of revolution. Right? What we're interested in is, what's the volume of this thing? How would you work out how much clay he's actually used? That would be the volume of this solid of revolution. Okay? Now, come back to the whiteboard. Let's think about what's going on here and how there's a parallel. When you want to work out an area, what you add up is a whole bunch of little rectangles. Yeah? Imagine taking that strange shape, which it's not a, it's not a trapezium, it's not a... It's not an anything, it's not a sector or anything like that, but it's a weird shape, and I, I slice it up, as it were, into these little you know, chunks. Okay, does that make sense? Now think about this object. Think about this object. If I were to take a similar approach, if I were to take this object and slice it up into little itty pieces, I won't get rectangles anymore, will I? If I slice this up, I will get... Now, it's tempting to say circles, it's very tempting to say circles, but remember, like, how many, how many dimensions does this object have? This, this object has two dimensions, which is why when you slice it up, you get two-dimensional objects, rectangles, right? Well, this is not a two-dimensional object. It's clearly a three-dimensional object. So when I slice it up, I should get really thin three-dimensional objects. Now, what would you call a circle if it had like a little bit of thickness to it? It would be a cylinder, wouldn't it? Off on the side. Over here, okay? Imagine I took a slice right out the middle. I can draw it over here. It's going to look something like this, right? Here's like the cross section, okay? So from somewhere like here, right? Here's the cross section, but I have a, a tiny little slice of it. So it's going to go like this. Not to scale, but I can't draw it with infinitesimal thinness, so you just have to deal with it, okay? So here is a cylinder. Now, I know how to deal with cylinders. The volume of every cylinder is pi r squared h, yeah? Now, just before we march forward, um, cylinders are, even though it's not the proper name, they're basically like prisms, aren't they? Basically like prisms. We don't call them prisms because it doesn't have flat edges, but you've got a cross section and then you've got a height, just like every other prism out there, okay? 